Before I knew it, I fell 25 feet, tumbled, hit some rocks, and fell into the river and almost drowned. I was laying in the floorboard of this helicopter being medevaced out. You, you can't ever prepare yourself for that. I was not going to walk again. I was not going to, um, you know, play sports again. So speak life, speak life, when the sun won't shine and you don't know why. Hi and welcome to Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith. Really happy that you have joined us. Today's program brought to you by Malone Dentistry. This is a show we do every single week at this time. We talk about, what do you think? Life, dealing with life. We all have struggles, we all have challenges, but we also all have victories and we all have failures. And uh, that's just what life is about. Today you're gonna meet somebody who I know will inspire you. You have no choice. She uh, is a paraplegic through an accident about 15 years ago, but not one to let that define her in any way. She is now uh, a mentor for the Tennessee Survivor Network Program uh, through the UT Medical Center. She uh, has been Miss Wheelchair of Tennessee. She uh, has been Miss Wheelchair America, third runner-up. She's also present uh, co-director of the Knoxville Sled Hockey Program. She was a U.S. paracycling national champion, uh, also a paraclimbing national champion, also USA para triathlon national champion. So, yeah, yeah she's, she's been quiet all of her life. Not really. She is a definition of inspiration. Carly Pearson is with me. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, I, I'm wonderful, and I'm so glad you're here. I want to hear just a little bit about your history before we dig in deep. You're from Maryville. Yes. And first of all, thank you for having me. Um, my pleasure. just very grateful to have the opportunity to talk to everyone out there. Yeah, my pleasure. So start us out. Um, uh, you don't have to start from day one, but, okay. but kind of lead us through your story a little sure. bit. So my family has been in the Maryville area for years, over 100 years. and Oh, my. Okay. Um, we have a farm there or had a farm and my father worked for IBM. So we moved around when I was younger and transplanted back here in, well, when I was probably six or seven okay. because my grandfather was ill. So we had to help so, out on the farm. So, so, so you got planted. I got planted. <laughs> okay. Yes. Planted here and just loved being outdoors, loved the farm life. I had an amazing childhood and, just grew up a tomboy right there in the little heart of West Maryville. Gotcha. So, okay. And went to Maryville High School. Nice. And played a couple of sports and did pretty good in school. And Yeah, you seem sporty, for sure. Yeah, definitely not too girly girl. So, <laughs> And that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a really good thing. Yeah. Um, so I played basketball, I ran track, and I played soccer for Maryville High School. I tried cheerleading, but they kicked me off because <laughs> I was too tomboyish. <laughs> So. <laughs> <laughs> didn't play that game. Huh? I didn't get kicked off, but yeah. Just didn't work. No, it didn't work. And um, I loved being around horses. Okay. So when I graduated high school, I thought, well, what could I do? You know, I don't want to get stuck behind a desk, um, you know, for my career. And my family has ties to Mississippi. Both of my parents are originally from Mississippi. So okay. I actually ended up going to Mississippi State my freshman year. Okay. And majoring in agriculture, um, just a general animal science. I was thinking I could figure out what I wanted to do from yeah, there. Yeah, the, the, it might show itself. Yeah. Right? But of course, I got homesick and by my sophomore year was right back here at okay. University of Tennessee <laughs> okay. and talked to an advisor. And he said, well, you like being outdoors. You like the woods. Why not try forestry? Oh, okay. So I ended up in forestry school and loved it. I liked being on the ag campus, hated the main campus, so it was kind of like its own separate school back then. Sure. And um, my senior year took a class in what they call forest protection, where we learn about wildland firefighting. We went down to Francis Marion National Forest in South Carolina and lit some fires, and I was kind of like a little pyromaniac kid in a candy store. Whoa. Yes, I thought it was awesome. So I thought, you know, I want to be a wildland firefighter when I get out of here. Okay. So so it um, went from horses to fighting fires. Yes. Okay. And um, I did try. 
I thought maybe vet school would be great until I took um, farm animal physiology and something sort of animal science class where they did some really gory things with the farm animals, and I decided I didn't have the stomach okay. for that. Okay. So that's how I switched. That, 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 okay, there was the bookmark. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely sure. turn in that chapter. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so firefighting was in the sights. Yes, and I graduated. I applied for some jobs uh, out way west, out in Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, Arizona, and got probably 25 phone calls, I think because I was a female right. with, a, with a degree. Okay. okay. And I decided to pick the most remote one. For the greatest experience, and I took a job out in um, the north zone of the Boise National Forest in Idaho on a hand crew. Okay. Okay. So I packed up my little Nissan Sentra two days after graduation, said goodbye to the family, saying, you know, I'll be back. (laughs) Not not soon, though. (laughs) (laughs) Don't don't call me, I'll call you. Right. And um, headed out west and started my career as a wildland firefighter in 1998. How amazing. That's yeah. adventurous. Yeah. That's just, yeah. Close your eyes, start driving. And I just, I thought it was great. I, I was a little scared. You know, I remember my first um, pulling into the Ranger District office, not knowing what to expect. And I remember kind of feeling like I, when I did start at kindergarten again, you know, so. <laughs> okay. um, but I didn't, didn't really need the training pants, I guess. Yeah. Or maybe I did. I don't know. <laughs> so. Yeah. But you, but you had, you had knowledge. Yes. And, um. And and I felt, you know, I was confident. I didn't have a lack of confidence back then. So okay. um, so anyway, I started out there and had some great experiences on a hand crew. And no, what, Define what a hand crew okay, is. Okay, a hand crew goes out and they are what what you call, you know, I don't want to say the bottom rung of the, of the hierarchy of firefighters, but... Maybe front line? They are definitely the front line. Okay. Um, that is... That's where most people get started unless they start on an engine. But to get a true Western experience, I feel like you need to be on a hand crew for at least one year so you can hike your tail off and (laughs) get in really good shape. Wow. Um, Okay. So that's where you start. You're on the front lines. You're digging fire line in very rugged, rough terrain and, um, you know, just... Out in the elements, so to speak. You camp, you stay out there on the fire line. Back then, you could spend 21 days on a fire before having to have a day off. Now that's changed because of safety. Right, right. um, So it was brutal. It was, but it again, I liked the challenge, and I was definitely outdoorsy. So it was pretty cool. And then then that fire season ended, and I kind of followed the fire seasons over. I got an opportunity to go to Minnesota and work for the land department there, doing mapping, GIS work, and working as a firefighter on the side. Okay. So I found myself getting involved in aviation because they do a lot of helicopter work in Minnesota. All right. So I did that, um, but it was way too cold for this southern gal. (laughs) So I started looking in the south and... Found a great opportunity in Texas okay. and took a job for the Texas Forest Service, which is state, as a regional fire coordinator out of wow. Waco. Okay. And that was an amazing learning experience. I got so much training and had some great brothers that I worked with and um, just, you so know. you were really getting well-rounded. I was, in, in I was uh, moving up the ladder and, okay. and got to take a lot of courses and just experience a lot of fire. Okay. And so I had everything from um, single engine air tanker manager to helibase manager to wow. um, crew boss. Okay. Incident manager, type four incidents. Um, you know, I was just filling up my plate also on the planning side because of my job in Texas. Okay. Having to um, manage a region. So it was really great. But, um, you know, the pay wasn't great. It was a state uh, job okay. and I was working okay. a lot and... I was young, and I just kind of felt like I needed to be a little bit closer to home and family. Okay. So I came back here um, to Tennessee and took a temporary job with the Park Service. Okay. Mostly back, it kind of booted me back in the career ladder a little bit just to take that job, but I wanted to stay in fire. So I was still in fire as a firefighter, um, but I was kind of back at like a project level, you know, doing project work and then still going out on what they call as a single resource. So you get put on a list, sort of like a national deployment list 
for your qualifications. And then when a fire comes up out west that, you know, they need resources for, they call your you first out. first call. Yes. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So okay. I got called out in August of 2002 to go um, become, to be a helicopter manager on the Tiller Complex fire, which was in um, the Umpqua National Forest in Oregon. So uh, about as far away from here as you could get. Yeah, okay. right there on the near the coast. OK, so, you know, packed my bags for my 21 days like I always did and mm-hmm. didn't think anything of it. Said goodbye to the family or, you know, see you later. Yeah. Be and back when that's out. Yep. <clears throat> OK. And headed out. We didn't have cell phones. Well, I guess we had the, you know, big old fit, flip phones. Back right. Then. right. They were, the they were coming was, around. OK. OK. Yeah. So, um, you know, the kind you had to hold with two hands. <laughs> <laughs> but what they call, some of them they call bag phones. The bag phones. Yes. Well, yes. they were just now coming out with the, the ones that had the big battery. So it, it was a little step above the bag phone. Okay. okay. But, um, but you had a little communication. Yeah, but I probably didn't call home enough, you know. Right. Now that I'm a mom. I, I, uh, I got that. you. Okay. Yeah, so, you see the flip side. Yeah. So anyway, I'd been on this fire for seven days managing two aircraft. And this was a very large fire, 30,000 acres 2,000 firefighters deployed to it. Um, We had over 15 aircraft. And what they do when you have um, a wildfire like that, and they're trying to conserve, you know, obviously money, fuel, and everything, they they create a helibase. So that's basically a makeshift airport for the aircraft to land. Okay. So we had all of our helicopters in a farmer's field, and um, we were, you know, a few miles from the fire down in a valley, fires up on the mountain, and the smoke was so thick, and I guess the wind, because of the ocean, was actually pushing the smoke down like an inversion in the valley instead of, you know, the smoke going up into the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. So the FAA said, you know, you guys aren't flying right now. It's Can't too dangerous. Anything. Yeah. So we sat on standby in this field for oh, a good seven days, 100 degree weather, and you know, it gets a little boring after a while. Okay, okay. <laughs> so and when you know a fire's really needing attention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, and being in the aircraft personnel, we just kind of, they're twiddling our thumbs and doing our PT and hanging out and okay. waiting on, waiting to, you know, get pulled to the fire. Okay. So okay. in the meantime, there's a river behind this field and um, I decided I would go check the river out, walk down there, splash a little water on my face just to cool off and... This was no surprise. A lot of guys even had fishing poles. Okay. I won't say that too loudly, though, right? Well, because I mean, it was a federal were, job. Ah, <laughs> gotcha. But you were you were t- you were grounded. Yeah, so we're grounded on standby, but on the clock. So okay. I decided to walk, you know, over across the the field to this river. My two aircraft that I was managing were the farthest away in the field as any. So okay. I got this really eerie feeling like maybe the weather's going to change and we're going to get the dispatch that my aircraft need to go. Okay. But the back of my head, I knew that wasn't the case. So okay. I continued on. And as I got closer to the river, there was a ravine you had to go down. And before I knew it, I was there and I fell 25 feet, tumbled, hit some rocks and fell into the river and almost drowned. Oh, no. Oh, no. So that's, um, that's kind of where I was, you know, quickly... The blink of an eye that happened, and I'm in the water. It's ten feet of water. Um, it wasn't Does rapid. Does anybody know you're there? Well, there was a guy close by who um, was able to get to me. At this point, I I kind of am coming to my senses or knowing that something really bad has happened, and I can't really bring myself to the surface because I'm in so much pain. I know. So this guy gets to me and pulls me over to the edge of the water, and um, that's where the reality of something not just little occurred. And I knew that I had really screwed something up really bad, you know, within my body. Right. And I couldn't move. Um, at this point, I really didn't feel like I could move anything because I was in excruciating pain. Right. So when I had fallen, I had somehow either hit the rocks or contorted myself enough to break my back about mid-level. Oh, no. And um, I was instantly paralyzed from the waist down. Oh, my goodness. So we're going to put a bookmark right there. Okay. Because you went from crazy adventurous to all of a sudden you had a tremendously terrible accident. Yes. Okay. This is Carly Pearson. And I know that there's a whole lot more to that story. And we will cover that in just a second. I can't wait. 
This is Dealing with Life. I'm Tom Baker. Uh, This show today brought to you by Malone Dentistry. What do you look for when you're looking for a dentist? You know, for me, it's it's a couple of things. Honesty, trustworthiness, uh, experience, knowledge, and also just overall how you treat me. Well, at Malone Dentistry, Dr. Stephen Malone treats you like you are a member of his family. And that's really important to me because you would treat a family member honestly, fairly, tenderly, and with good judgment. And that's what uh, I'd really appreciate. Family and restorative dentistry, he does it all. He does everything that you would possibly need. He explains exactly what is necessary. He explains exactly what he will do and what you can expect from it. He has been uh, here for 20 years. I've been a patient of his for 20 years. Why? Because it's a truly good experience. Malone Dentistry, KnoxvilleSmiles.com. They're right off of Kingston Pike on South Peters Road, Malone Dentistry. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker. We will have more of Carly Pearson in just moments. So don't you be afraid of giants in your way. With God, you know that anything's possible. Who says you gotta have it all figured out? Who says you'll never feel alone in the crowd? to Dealing with Life. I'm Tom Baker, author of One Dog's Faith. Uh, Today's show brought to you by Malone Dentistry. We have uh, in the studio today Carly Pearson. So uh, Carly, uh, when we went to break a minute ago, uh, we just found out you had a terrible accident while in the middle of a fire uh, fight. So um, you you fell down an embankment and ended up in the water and were in terrible pain. So that's Mm -hmm. where we were. Let's go from there. Okay. So from there, um, you know, the one guy was there, then four or five more came and they're yelling, do I need a medic? (laughs) Yeah. And you know, the guys, yeah, she needs a medic. She can't move. So they put me on a spine board and I was flown to Medford, um, Oregon to Rogue Valley Medical Center. And ironically, I was flown in this helicopter that I had spent the whole summer, not the whole summer, but a lot of the summer prior working uh fighting fires in florida out of okay and i just and so they they brought it to oregon to help with this yeah fire. so okay. they were happened to be stationed on the same fire and and knew the um crew really well that was you know okay with the helicopter and it's just it's the ironic part is that i was you know you were among this, friends yes and i was the one laying in the floorboard of this helicopter being medevaced out you just you you can't ever prepare yourself for that. That's no. not something that you even think about. So, and I'm sure they it was difficult for them too because they knew you. So yeah, well. I mean, we all knew each other on the Hella base. So, Gosh, um, goodness. Okay. So it was tough. So I get to the you know trauma center, and luckily, even though this hospital was small, it was a level one trauma center similar here to University of Tennessee. Okay. So um, they knew what they were doing. Yeah, they knew what they were doing, and you know they said, well, you know we. You're paralyzed from the waist down, but at this point, you know, shock's setting in, and I'm kind of not really in with it. Yeah. And they said, you know, you're going to have to have surgery, and I guess I was thinking that that was kind of going to fix the problem. Right. Sort of like a broken arm. Okay, good. Yeah, Yeah. okay, great. We're going to fix this. I'm going to run out of this hospital. (laughs) And and there's just so much going on in your head, you know, and and then basically I was out of it for a few days because I had to wait on the surgery, and... Three days later, I had um, an eight-hour surgery with three surgeons, a neurosurgeon, an orthopedic, and a general surgeon. And wow. So the neurosurgeon told my family that, and, and my parents, uh, my mother and stepfather flew out and okay. um, were there with me. And he told them that if they ha- he had to do a surgery like that every day, he would quit. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently I had a lot of bone fragments that, you know, kind of, shattered across my body so i have um, a lot of scars in the front and the back of my uh, torso and my back all the way down my back so i woke up and i had 95 staples or somewhere around that range um, a lot wow and um i have you know probably eight inches of metal going down you know, my spine to stabilize the vertebrae. And that's, that's just to stabilize. Yeah. Right. It, it wasn't really to fix. No. So when you have a spinal cord injury, you know, um, 
that's not a repairable process because of the um, the nerves. They, right. Once they're damaged, that's it's just that's you know, what happens. Somebody go out there and research that, and let's get get a cure for <laughs> spinal cord injury. But yeah, pr- so, that's, that's a that's a prayer. Yeah. Yeah. So I woke up and um, I think that's kind of when the reality started to set in for me that this was this was a really bad, you know, mistake. And this was something that was not really fixable in the sense that I was not going to walk again. I was not going to, um, you know, play sports again. I wasn't I still played recreational soccer. I played soccer here at UT for club okay. team. So okay. it was big on my list of yeah, yeah. pastimes. Yeah. And just part of who you are. Yeah. And then the whole firefighting thing, that was my life. So just the whole shock of all of a sudden going from so active to immobile. Yeah. You know, I couldn't really, I couldn't sit up or even roll over in the bed at this point. So Goodness. it was just, it was completely devastating. You know, there was, there was no, it was death. I'm sure that I felt like. Yeah, life is over. Yes. Yeah. Um. So I spent two weeks there trying to get stabilized enough to be flown back here. And then I flew back here um, on a, you know, very expensive (laughs) um, Learjet because I couldn't fly commercial to start rehab at Patricia Neal, um, which is part of the Fort Sanders program. So I started my rehab and then I became very ill with a secondary issue that happens sometimes. uh, I'll spare all the details. It's a rare condition that sometimes women with spinal cord injury get. And basically um, I couldn't quit throwing up. And so um, it's called superior mesentery artery syndrome and an an artery clamps off, you know, that's uh, near your intestines. So it was not fun. And it took just, just add to the difficulties. It took some days to diagnose that. And it was a huge setback for me. Yeah, Um, It just, but in a way, when I look back on it, it was good. And and the reason I say that it was good is because it made me realize that, you know, I was actually fighting for my life during that time. Yeah. And the spinal cord injury after I was stabilized was not life threatening. So it kind of put a different perspective or spin on things, okay. even though it was horrible to experience. Yeah, but it put your mind in a new perspective. Yeah. So, you know, when I was in such a low spot with the spinal cord injury, you know, I was so focused on the past and that I couldn't, I couldn't go back to all those things. Yeah. And then, and then that happened and I was like, okay, thank God I'm not throwing up anymore. <laughs> so, I <laughs> okay. mean, because it was constant, it was a constant, um, they had to tube me for, you know, a couple of weeks and I couldn't really talk or anything because I had so many tubes in every, you know, mouth and nose and all that. So it just, you were, you were happy that that was over. I was, yeah. and I didn't leave my room for a few weeks. And finally, one of my therapists came and got me and wheeled me out and outside. And I remember that very vividly because I hadn't seen the outside in so many weeks. Yeah. And so. Realized, wait a minute, there's beauty. Yeah. There's beauty around So here. it pushed me to another level in my rehab and I started working a lot harder. I started going down to, um therapy room even when I didn't have therapy and trying to do some arm exercises and on your own yeah on my own and just um trying to fight back okay you know and I still had this um impression faith-wise I grew up um I guess to back up a little bit I grew up um at Alcoa First Baptist okay and you know always believed I guess from an early age and you know felt like I had a fairly strong faith uh of course there were years where I wasn't as focused. For the most part, you know, I believed, I prayed, I, you know, asked for forgiveness. And I honestly thought that, that I may be like the miracle child (laughs) in my head. I thought, okay, you know, God's going to use me as a miracle. He's going to, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to go from not being able to move anything below my waist to, you know, cracking my ankles and bending my knees and standing up out of this bed. Anything is possible. Yes, and I own. and I believe that you know, um, for some people that's the route. Yeah. Um, so for quite a while, I would lay in bed at night. I would be this strong firefighter during the day, and but at night I would cry myself to sleep and pray that prayer that you know God please you know make me make me be the miracle you know yeah. whatever um, yeah. you can do I I want to be able to move tomorrow. So I would wake up and go through this little gamut of tests in my head. You know, can I wiggle my toes? Can I bend my knees? Can I can I flinch this muscle or that? And, you know, there just wasn't, the progress was very slow. 
That's hard. Yes, it was hard, hard. But at the same time, I was putting on a front. I mean, I was strong during the day. I was not letting that get me down. I was going to work my tail off because that's my that's my nature. Okay. So I did actually start to get a twinge of movement in my left quad. No. I mean, it was just uh, tiny. After, after how long? Probably three weeks to a month. Okay. And I remember very vividly laying in the hospital, and I remember somebody being in the room, and we were like, oh, wow, look at that. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. So but I what started. A, what a glimpse of hope. Yeah. So I started working on that leg and just like moving. I mean, trying to pull my knee up to my chest is the best way to describe it. And I would do that like hundreds of times laying in the hospital bed. Okay. And um, I started to get, you know, a little stronger and a little more movement come back. And that really did. It, it drove me to sort of the next playing field, if you will, of of my recovery. Yeah. Because it, it did going, give me. To keep trying. You know, and, and the doctors were, I don't want to say they were kind of gloom and doom, but it was, the prognosis was, you know, fairly grim that I would have no movement below my waist. There okay. is kind of two types of spinal cord injury. There's what they call a complete injury, which would be similar to what mine was supposed to be, where it's almost like your spinal cord is severed. Severed, yeah. And then there's an incomplete injury where you, you know, you might have nerve damage that there might be swelling around and inflammation. And once that swelling goes down, you might, you, you know, s- regain you some see movement. some improvement, yeah. And usually they're very um, guarded with how they word all of that because, you know, they don't want to plant false hope. Yeah. But at the same time, they want to give you motivation. Never happens. Yeah. yeah. So um, I continued working hard, but I also continued praying fervently and praying for God to reveal to me why. I mean, what was the reason for this? You know, I had done crazy things, cut down forty-four inch trees on the side of cliffs, and worked out of helicopters, hooked stuff up on you know load lines right under the belly of a helicopter while it was hovering over me, and you know, um, all kinds of things. And here I was just <laughs> meandering, yeah. basically. Yeah. So what, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, yeah. So I just, I spent a lot of time uh, quiet asking for answers. Why was I the person that went through this? And, and why did it have to be me? Yeah. And, and that's, that's a very common thought and yeah. question. Why? What is going on? Yeah. Why me? Yeah. And I remember, um, so I had what I call a, a few little come to Jesus moments and I hope nobody takes that the wrong way, but, um, where God had to step out and like make himself a lot more known and reveal to me some whys. One of those was, um, well, there's actually three. Okay. So one of those was one night it was really late in the hospital and I was on a floor where there were brain and spinal cord injuries. So I was actually very well off compared to other compared patients. Compared to some, yeah, yes. sure, sure. And there was a man that was yelling in the middle of the night, help, help. And and I was kind of far away from the nurse's station. So I just thought, okay, such and such is kind of off his rocker tonight with the brain injury. And I laid there for a good 30 minutes listening to him yell. And okay. then all of a sudden it dawned on me that it was not a brain injury patient. It was a spinal cord injury patient who... Um, was a quadriplegic, which means all four of his limbs were right, affected, and right. he could not reach over and push the nurse call button. And that was all he could do was just yell. Yeah, and it broke my heart. I mean, it literally stopped me in my tracks, and it made me realize that I needed to be grateful, number one, that I survived not just almost drowning in a river, this rare illness, but that I now have the use of my upper body, the complete use of my upper body. Yeah. Not so affected. it was just tears started flowing and they were tears of shame that I didn't see this, um, that I should be grateful yeah, before then. But uh, yeah, I get that. You know, I do get um, that. I mean, it, it, it's a process. A yeah. Journey, a journey to find that, right. that joy instead of the, the, the gloom and doom. Yeah. But you know, we can't be joyful all the time, 24 yeah. seven. Yeah. We can try, but, um, no, so, we, we've got to experience the other part too. Yeah. So, I kind of had this new little light within after that. Then I had a conversation with my father who, you know, it was another bad day, I guess, for me. And he, he said, you know, Carly, he was there at the hospital visiting. He said, we didn't really know for hours what happened. We didn't know if you were dead or alive. Oh, gosh. And we didn't know 
whether you being a parent, you yes, yeah. I know this now, but yeah. then I probably didn't understand as well. But he said, you know, instead you you came back to us instead of coming back in a box oh, where gosh. we would have to bury you. Yeah, and that it, puts it, it in perspective. It did, and it was it was kind of a tough love moment, but it was very important that he say that to me. Yeah, because it made me realize again that I needed to be grateful. This is this is. There are a lot of blessings yeah. in this. Uh, Carly Pearson is with us, and what what an incredible story of of bravery, of of journey, of challenge. Uh, and there's more. There's a word called victory, and I want you to hear about it. This is dealing with life. I'm Tom Baker. Today's show brought to you by Malone Dentistry, right off of Kingston Pike on South Peters Road. Dr. Stephen Malone is one who treats you like a member of his own family, and that's really important. I've been a patient of his for 20 years. He and his uh, whole staff of 15 are just good people. People you want to be around, people that you want to help you uh, make your mouth the best it can be. They do it all. Restorative, preventative, cosmetic, and the schooling that Dr. Stephen Malone has way beyond what a license requires. Malone Dentistry, their amazing staff of 15, will take care of you and your family. Dr. Stephen Malone, Malone Dentistry, right off Kingston Pike on South Peters Road, KnoxvilleSmiles.com. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker. This is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker. Really happy to have you in the room with us. Uh, Carly Pearson is in the studio with me. Today's program is brought to you by Malone Dentistry. Carly has been sharing her story of being tremendously active growing up and then uh, being a a female firefighter uh, really all over the country and then uh, suffering uh, a a very difficult accident uh, rendering you paraplegic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you uh, left us uh, in the last segment talking about rehab Mm -hmm. and and, uh, a few moments where you went, wait a minute, this is a blessing. Yeah. So, and then I said there was three, kind of three times and then... um, Yeah, we covered two. Yes. Okay. So the third one, and I don't think he'll mind, one of my coaches from high school, Brett Uh Coulter and his wife, Maria, came and came to visit me. Yes. Okay. He was my track coach. She had been my basketball coach. And they were um, very impactful in my life growing up. Before this? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, Just like family. You know, they just were great people. And he came in the room and he was very upset. Um, because here, one of his former students who, you know, ran track for him and played basketball was, you know, down. Yeah. And I remember having to console him. <laughs> but <laughs> you, were do- you were doing the yeah. ministering. Okay. But um, he said something that just resonated with me. He said, I can't think of a worse person or a better person for this to happen to. And it just kind of hit home because his point was that I was really strong. And that I was going to get through this, okay. but that it was going to be tough. Yeah. And it was going to be very hard and challenging, but he knew that I could, I could do it. You're not a foreigner to challenge. Yeah. So in those moments, just kind of gave me the little push that I needed to, you know, get to the next point in my life, which took me um, out of rehab and, and kind of getting back out into the community. I did have to move back in with my parents. I shouldn't say have to, but I was 27 when I was injured. So. Yeah, that's that's not something you have in your plan. No. Okay, when I'm 27, I'm going to move back yeah. in with my parents. No. But I, I yeah. still needed help with daily care, sure. and I'm very grateful to my family who's been so amazingly supportive all along of this. So um, it was an adjustment period, and um, I, I guess at some point my sister, who's a former police officer for Blount County Sheriff's Office, so you know you don't really want to tell her no. No. She came, she's younger than me, but we'd always played sport together, sports together. And she came and got me and said, well, we're going to the gym. <laughs> and I said, nope, we're not going to the gym. Yeah. She said, get in the car. We're going to the gym. <laughs> okay. 
And it was a turning point for me because it was one of the first times back out in the community and I was just very self-confident or self-conscious, conscious, 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 sorry, about what people were thinking. You know, what are they looking at me and thinking? What is she doing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and I'm wearing this big, heavy back brace that looked like a turtle shell. But I go to the gym back back in the day. This was Primo's downtown. So this is old school, you know. Okay, okay. But everybody there was amazing. I mean, the community just embraced me and... It gave me an outlet, so I started going to the gym, working out two or three days a week, and getting stronger. And um, and then somebody introduced me to sports, to adaptive sports. And I think adaptive the, sports, uh, including like what? What are some so of the- bicycling, um, racing in a racing wheelchair? Okay, um, bicycling would be using a hand cycle. Gotcha. Um, snow skiing. I do what's called mono skiing. Um, so yes. there were all these, you know, little trickles of information coming in and I was just blown away. I thought that part of my life was completely over, Yeah, you know, and people were trying to do things like give me jewelry making stuff, like, like a whole set of beads. And my, um, my brother who love his heart is very musical and gave me this amazing guitar, but I'm just not very creative. I'm very <laughs> athletic, but I yeah. don't have that kind I'll of do creativity that later. Yeah. So yeah. I tried to embrace that stuff, but it just wasn't happening. So when sports was introduced to me, I was like, oh, okay, so maybe life's not over after all. Maybe I just need to find a new way to adapt. It's just, yeah, just a a different path. So I I think I started swimming. Um, At first, I couldn't even lift my head out of water. I had to use a snorkel. And eventually, I got to where I was swimming a lap. Then I was swimming a mile. And so my sister, again, the um, former police officer, she said, well, why don't we do a triathlon? And I was like, uh, okay. Yeah. A triathlon, run, bike, and swim. And I'm like, I guess I need to borrow equipment because I didn't have anything. Okay. And I managed to borrow equipment from friends in the rehab center and went and did the either, I think, the Springbrook Triathlon. And the people, again, were just amazing. They were hoorahing, you yeah, know, just supportive. supporting me on as I continued on the race course. And the, the feeling was amazing. And it just, it catapulted me you, yeah. Yes, into this next level. It was like the line coming out of the cage. I can't explain it. I just, just, it was a release of so much tension and stress and pressure. And, and that feeling that uh, my life is never going to include sports again. Right. Yeah. So um, fast forward, I, I got married and had my son in 2005. And then I still had a lot, I had aspirations to, you know, make a national team, go to the Paralympics. So I started cycling really heavy in 2009 with um, the hand cycle. Yeah. And that year I actually made the national team in cycling, in paracycling and in triathlon. And I won nationals in both and then got to go and travel on the national team to Dubai and to Budapest, Hungary. And um, it was really, it was awesome. And So uh, fast forward to 2012, I had my daughter, and then I got introduced to climbing, to indoor rock climbing. So I've gotten to rock climb, um, and I went to nationals, qualified to go to Spain (laughs) and France. You don't just settle for doing it. You go for national championships. Yeah. That's amazing. um, So so climbing, and now I'm the director of an adaptive sled hockey program here with a couple other people to help run the program, and we've This just, is with the Ice Bears. Well, yeah, so we sort of umbrellaed under them for okay. the name. Um, they've been extremely supportive. We actually got our start, though, with the Knoxville Amateur Hockey Association, who okay. applied for a grant, and Knoxville got the grant nice. in order for us to get the sleds. Nice. So we got the sleds, and we started the program about a year ago, and now we have, you know, about 10 players. We're looking for a few more, and um, it's been awesome. We just went to a tournament in Tampa this past weekend. We did get our tails kicked at every game, but we're a new team. Yeah. We're, most yeah. of our players are new, and yeah. um, it's not. It's not the. That's not the victory. No. The victory is you're there, and and, you're, and, and some of these people again, they're right where I was. You know, they think that there's not an opportunity for them to get back out there and compete. Yes, and and, and enjoy and have a passion like that. Yeah. So, Carly, if you could now. 
Go back and vis- visit yourself in the hospital room maybe a couple after the after the reality set in, after the the shock kind of wore off. What would you tell yourself? You know, I think I would just keep telling myself that it was going to be okay, that that this is this is going to pass. Yeah. Um, you know, and have a little more faith. Um, I mean, I I did have faith, but I I didn't see where the perp I didn't see that his purpose was going to be different than what sort of I thought his purpose was. Right. For me. You didn't think it was going to be good. You well, was- I just I thought, you know, what have I done? Am I cursed? Is there a reason? You know, why? Why is this? And, and I needed to quit asking why and saying, OK, what can I do? How do you want me to use this? to further your purpose. That's that's and, the magic question. Yeah, and and so once I started kind of realizing that it wasn't about me. It's about, you know, helping others. It's about, you know, defining his purpose for my life. Yeah. Then I started figuring out that, you know, my passion was in sports and helping people um and in family because there's a lot of people with disabilities that don't think that they can have families and that's just not true. Yeah, you've got you know? two children. Yes. So and that's um, that, that's just fantastic. Yeah. And 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 you uh, are such an inspiration to people who think that it's done. Yeah. That that this is just the way it's going to be, and I'm going to be depressed for the rest of my life. And and look at you. How many national championships do you have? Um. Nine. <laughs> That's I think awesome. nine. One one might be a silver, um, but I have a silver medal world championship. And then um, I think I have nine. I'd have to go back and count. But five cycling and three climbing. Did you see one that coming? One is a silver. Did you, again, laying in the bed, did you see that coming? Oh, no. I mean, no. I, I remember, I mean, you know, you are you can't even roll over in the bed. You can't sit up when you have an injury like mine. You can't, you can't, someone has to come and roll you over. You right. can't dress yourself. You can't go to the bathroom on your own. You can't do things that we learn to do from the age of a toddler and on. take for granted. Yes. Yeah. It's pretty crazy to look back on it and yeah. think, yeah, it's pretty cool. I wouldn't have had those opportunities had I not been injured. I would have Isn't never that, made it, it to that level a of way to look at athleticism. It. A lot or, of people aren't able to look at it that way. But no, I mean, it's the they truth. Should. I would have always just played recreational sports and, you know, yeah. maybe went and did a 5K and thought, okay, this is cool. This is it. You know, but now I've this will be my tenth year doing the Knoxville Marathon. Wow. So that's just awesome. Hopefully I'll get to do it, knock on wood. That is awesome. Carly Pearson is with us. What an inspiration uh, and a story of victory. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about how people can get involved, how uh, you can help connect them with the right people in just a minute. This is Dealing with Life. I'm Tom Baker. Uh, today's show brought to you by Malone Dentistry. <laughs> You're listening to Dealing with Life. I'm Tom Baker, and what a great, great, inspiring show this uh, has been. Carly Pearson uh, is in the studio, and we have uh, really uh, we've dissected a lot of your life, and I know there's a lot more that that uh, we had to speed read through. But um, I think what uh, a person can take away from your life, uh, for those who haven't heard, you, you had a, a very difficult injury, spinal injury, and you. Uh, powered through and have now have non-national championships uh, through sports. Mm-hmm. What do you say to somebody who is struggling, who, who believes that life is, is truly uh, not ever going to be uh, what they want it to be through, through a spinal injury or, or a, a physical disability? I think just embracing what you have whether it's, you know, whether it's a spinal cord injury or an illness or whatever, but Whatever you have the ability to do is what we need to embrace now. Yeah. And take, you know, take the time. I mean, time is fleeting. You know, we only get one chance at this life. And we're here for a purpose and a reason. And this circumstance that you're in, you know, the physical, mental, emotional circumstance does not have to define who you are as a person. Right. Right. And, don't don't look at what you don't have. Right. Look at what you have and what your abilities are and what you can do with that. And there's no reason that 
you can't still reach your goals and dreams mm. just because of your circumstances, whether it's physical or, you know, yeah. an illness or something. So somebody wants to, uh, to stretch out and try sports. Mm -hmm. What, what do they do? So they can reach out to me at, um, Knoxville sled hockey at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Knoxville sled bears. I'm also very involved in catalyst sports, which is an outreach program here for, um, people with disabilities and it's catalyst sports, Knoxville. You can find us on Facebook. Great. Um, okay. reach out to you and you can give them my email address as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just call, uh, uh, joy six or get a hold of joy six twenty, and they'll hook us up yes. as well for, to, 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 uh, hook together with Carly. Uh, and you also speak. Yes. Uh, and, and I, I think that's, that's what a powerful, uh, presentation you Thank give. You. Uh, how does somebody get a hold of you for speaking? same reason? Just, uh, email me and you know, we can, uh, contact each other that way and we can go from there i'm also on facebook but it's sometimes harder to find you know that way yeah so. yeah but carly pearson i'm so blessed to hear your story and to have you share your story of, of victory and inspiration um from from being in a place where you thought this is it yep. I'm, I'm stuck in bed yeah it was over yeah and, and just to rise from the ashes i say you know, literally. <laughs> yeah. So just, you can never give up. I, I just think that's the most important thing is to keep fighting. Find your inner fight and, and move forward. Whatever it takes, you know, find that lion inside of you. Yeah, it's there. It is. It's very much there. And God is there for the reaching. He is. You have to, you have to quiet yourself. I have figured that out. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're not going to hear him if you're, if you're not listening. And, and if you're yelling and angry, and it's very common and normal mm -hmm. to say, why me? But then it's, it, there, there's a point where you got to stop and say, what am I to do with this? Yes, exactly. and, and there will be an answer. Yes. Praise God. Carly Pearson, this is Dealing With Life. I'm Tom Baker. Today's show brought to you by Malone Dentistry. I pray that as you face your struggles, your difficulties, and we all have them, that you see God's strength ready for the taking. <laughs>